The COVID crisis has knocked Europe off the UK headlines for the first time in years. But the talks are ongoing and they're not going well. We asked Tory MP Daniel Kaczynski, the SNP's Alec Neil, and head of the New Europeans, Roger Casali, whatever happened to Brexit? Join us on the Alex Salmon Show, on air and online. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from stricken Aberdeenshire in Scotland, where we have turned to a subject which has dominated UK politics but has hardly got a mention during the last three months of the COVID crisis. The subject is Europe. Brexit consumed the headlines in the United Kingdom for five years, but now it doesn't even get reported, despite the fact that the big decisions on a long-term trade deal and citizenship rights remain to be made. The United Kingdom formally left the European Union on the 31st of January this year, but nothing really changed because a transitional agreement kicked in to buy the time required to hammer out a long-term agreement. Now, the government, the UK government, is adamant that there will be no extension of that transitional period. However, in certain senses, political reality is beginning to impinge on the government's position. Last week, for example, they bowed to pressure from new Labour leader Sir Keir Stammer about charges for foreign nationals in the National Health Service. Mr Speaker, every Thursday we go out and clap for our carers. Many of them are risking their lives for the sakes of all of us. Does the Prime Minister think that it's right that care workers coming from abroad and working on our front line should have to pay a surcharge of hundreds, sometimes thousands of pounds, to use the NHS themselves? Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I thought a great deal about this, and I, I, I do accept and I do understand the difficulties faced by uh, our amazing NHS staff, and uh, like him, I've been a personal beneficiary of uh, people who've come from, uh, carers who've come from abroad and, and frankly, saved my life. Uh, so uh, I know exactly the importance of, of what he says. But on the other hand, we must look at the realities that this is a, a, a great national service, it's a national institution, it needs funding, and those contributions actually help us to raise about £900 million. Pounds, and uh, it, it's very easy, uh, very difficult in the current circumstances to find alternative sources. So, with, with great respect to the point that he makes, I do think that that is the right way forward. Only one day later, the Prime Minister conceded the point. Others are warning that without some extension to the transitional period, many aspects of the negotiations are being made more difficult and the looming recession may be turned into something much worse. Up until now, the Prime Minister is having none of it. In Ireland, both jurisdictions are working hard uh, to organise contact tracing on a north-south basis. But the Prime Minister's obsession with avoiding a Brexit transition extension means we are critically uh, risking crashing out without a data-sharing framework. This will critically undermine our ability to protect people from COVID-19. When will he put the lives of people in our community above the petty, narrow Brexiteer politics? I must re respectfully disagree with the honourable gentleman. Uh, we are working very closely, not just with our co uh, with our colleagues in uh, the government in Northern Ireland, but also with our colleagues in Dublin. I had a very good conversation uh, with Leo uh, Varadkar the other day, and we saw eye to eye on on the way forward. There's a huge amount shared between the UK and Ireland, and it will continue uh, to be so. In a normal world, the camera crews would be gathered outside the. The Justice Lipsius building in Brussels, waiting for the white smoke to emerge, sounding agreement in the negotiations. But now, of course, negotiations are having to be conducted online by, by Skype and by Zoom. And by all accounts, they're not going well. The European Trade Commissioner, Ireland's Phil Hogan, has even suggested that the UK is deliberately dragging its feet to cover the impact of Brexit under the Covid recession. I speak to Daniel Kaczynski, the 
Tory MP from Shropshire, tells this programme that Eurosceptics like him and his colleagues will brook no delay in the transitional agreement. The head of the new European pressure group and former Labour MP Roger Casale says it would be lunacy to risk a no-deal Brexit and make the coming recession much, much worse. Meanwhile, SNP parliamentarian Alec Neil warns that vital Scottish interests may be sacrificed in the online negotiations. These key interviews are coming up later in the programme. But now to Tasmina in Glasgow with your tweets, your emails and your messages. Thank you, Alex. In response to last week's show on the pandemic, a new economic policy featuring economists Vicky Price and George Kerevan, Scott says there is a big looming recession coming. Mark says scrap HS2 and save billions. Norma says scrap Trident and save money. Mary White says I have to say I've despaired for a lack of independence since the beginning of this crisis. We could have done so much more and quicker. Additionally, we would have had a substantial oil wealth fund by now, which could have helped Scotland enormously. James says, I disagree. We would have been in deep trouble and I voted yes for independence. Linda says, when is Scotland going to be out of lockdown? Katie says, when our Scottish government is absolutely sure the greatest risk is past and not before. Louise says, when its people are safe and that's when lockdown should end, not before. Not enough people actually understand this pandemic. People don't realise how close it actually is. Daniel Kaczynski is an unusual Conservative MP, an ardent Eurosceptic from Shropshire. He's also the greatest parliamentary champion of the rights of the Polish community in the UK. Is he happy with the current state of the negotiations? Daniel Kaczynski, many people are saying it's time for a, a delay in the transitional a timetable given the prevailing circumstances. What's your opinion on that? Well, I have, uh, along with other Conservative MPs, urged the Prime Minister to ensure that we respect that deadline of the 31st of December. Um, the biggest exporter to the European Union from my constituency, Salop Design and Engineering, big manufacturing exporters, they say to me, our biggest problem is the ongoing uncertainty of what our new trade relationship will be like with the European Union. We want you to get on with it. It's the uncertainty which is hampering our ability to make whatever necessary changes are required and to plan for the future. But how realistic is that, given there are 20 working groups who haven't been able to, to meet physically, who have been doing all their conversations by Zoom, that the Two lead negotiators, David Frost and Michel Barnier, have both been ill. Is it really realistic to set this end-year deadline under the prevailing circumstances? We joined the European Economic Community on the day I was born, the 24th of January 1972. And since that time, we have handed over, according to the House of Commons Library, £620 billion of taxpayers' money. These are staggering amounts of money. And if the European Union wants a good, healthy new relationship with the United Kingdom, it has to be predicated on respecting the fact that we are an independent, sovereign third party and that access to our fishing um, rights is not going to be on the table in the way that they would like. And we are not going to, I'm afraid, agree to uh, adhering to uh, the European Court of Justice and all the rules and regulations that they want to impose on the United Kingdom. We want a free trade deal. We have a trade deficit with them of £71 billion a year. So if we went to, went to WTO terms, Alec, they would lose out for far more than we would because their companies would have to pay far more in duties than our companies would have to pay them. So let's have a meaningful, sensible free trade agreement, but showing one another due respect as independent third party interlocutors. Now, the Irish Trade Commissioner in the last week uh, has said that he doesn't think the UK are negotiating seriously and are, are heading for uh, the dreaded no deal Brexit after all. Is there any truth in that allegation? At no stage, Alec have the European Union sought to impose the sort of conditions 
on any other country, whether it's Canada or any other country, that they are seeking to impose on the United Kingdom. That is practically uh, not feasible, and it will lead to a no deal, unfortunately, if the European Union don't change their stance. To betray what the British people voted for, to sell out at this stage, to allow the European Court of Justice to override the decisions of the British Supreme Court would not be delivering Brexit, and it would create a massive disconnect between ourselves as the governing party and millions of people across the country who voted for and believe in Brexit and continue to believe in it. Now, Daniel Kuczynski, you, you've been a, a great champion of the, the rights of the Polish community in the United Kingdom. Are, are you content and satisfied with the way that the settled status uh, provisions are, are working out? And has the Home Secretary covered the bases and marking the contribution of other European nationals to the United Kingdom? Well, that's a very good question. And by the way, we celebrate uh, the extraordinary contribution that uh, uh, Poles make to Scotland, Wales, uh, Northern Ireland and England. Um, there are now uh, over 900,000 Poles living and contributing in this country. And there's the first ever Polish-born British Member of Parliament. I take a great interest in how these people's uh, contribution is celebrated and how their rights are protected. I don't want immigration to be in the top five issues during an election campaign. I want us to fo focus on our differences between uh, funding schools and hospitals. Immigration should not be in the top five issues at a general election. And if we can convince the British people that immigration is working in their interests and is being done in a sustainable and managed way, then I can see in our lifetimes immigration not being the key issue at election times that unfortunately it's become over the last three or four general elections. And finally, Dina Kuczynski, you were celebrating as one of the country's leading Brexiteers at the end of January this year, uh, the formal Brexit from the European Union. Uh, do you expect to be celebrating again on Hogmanay, December the 31st, that the final seal is put on that exit by the signing of a, a new trade agreement? Well, Alec, I've had some people say to me that uh, I'm a traitor to the Polish cause because I have uh, voted for Brexit. How can an immigrant to this country vote for Brexit? And uh, they call it hypocritical. I would answer them by saying this. It is up to us now to demonstrate that having voted to leave the European Union, we can have and will have just as strong military ties with these countries through NATO and opportunities to engage with one another in commercial tr uh, transactions, but also academic uh, and other exchanges. To the, to the degree that the European Union countries have done so thus far, but without being in a political union without abandoning our sovereignty. That is the challenge. If we succeed, then of course we will be celebrating and others will be joining us. If we fail, uh, then of course the whole concept of having another referendum and taking us back to the European Union is one that we will have to grapple with. But I would not have recommended this path to my constituents uh, in 2016, unless, unless I was absolutely convinced that after an experiment of 48 years of membership of this organization, it was not working in the national economic strategic interests of the United Kingdom. I stand by that decision, and I look forward to working with European Union countries from our new position of independence and sovereignty. Uh, and that celebration, will it be conducted with Scotch whiskey, Polish vodka, or English sparkling wine, Daniel? <laughs> I have to admit, I shouldn't admit, but my I always drink Scottish whiskey uh, because it's the best uh, alcohol uh, available. Daniel Kuczynski, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Alec. Take care. Join us after the break, where we discuss further whether the end of the year will be the end of the line for Britain and Europe. Welcome back. 
It has taken a world pandemic to blow the European issue off the front pages. However, Roger Casale, the former Labour MP, says the government are still playing fast and loose with Britain's interests in Europe. Roger Casale joins me from Italy. Great to be back, Alex. Great to see you. Roger, what is your key fears about the state of the negotiations on the timetable through the transitional agreement that are going on at the, the present moment? What difficulties do you see? Well, my principal fear, Alex, is the one that I've always had, and, and it's the one I think that is at the back of the mind of Michel Barnier and the heads of state of the 27 EU member states. Uh, they must be asking themselves, uh, are the British government in good faith? I mean, that's not something that they can say publicly, but it must be the thought in the back of their minds. And it's, it's something like that a campaigning organisation like New Europeans can say publicly, and we do. It's very difficult to understand um, what the British government are playing at at the moment, what they think they are doing. What the British government must do is to request an extension or if the European Union were to offer an extension, the British government must accept that. But at the moment, it looks as if there's no prospect of uh, that happening, and therefore um, Britain will leave without a deal. But what possible motivation could the UK government and David Frost, uh, Sherpa, the lead negotiator, have for not attempting to come to an agreement? What would be the political motivation for for such a stance? It may well be that they're thinking we can wrap up the economic damage of a no-deal Brexit uh, by blaming it on the fallout from the COVID crisis. So people somehow will not notice because it will be uh, so bad anyway. That is totally irresponsible, calculating, manipulative. Uh, but uh, if that is what the game is, uh, it won't be behaviour that we've seen for the first time, will it? Now, your old party, the Labour Party, have been pretty quiet uh, about the issue of uh, an extension in the House of Commons. Do you think that's the new leader, Sir Keir Starmer, just uh, boxing clever uh, and waiting his time? Or do you think the Labour Party are genuinely ambiguous about whether there should be an extension or not? Well, I, that's a very good question, um, Alex. And um, yes, the Labour Party is a very broad church and there will be different points of view. But it's just elected a new leader with an overwhelming majority and he has a clear mandate. And he, uh, I'm sure, uh, he's a very intelligent man. He will see the, the, the folly of the Conservatives' uh, policy, not requesting an extension. Uh, and it is surprising that he hasn't himself stepped up and, and called for uh, that extension, and I hope he will do that. There is a petition, a House of Commons petition, calling for an extension, which uh, thousands and thousands of people are signing, and I'd encourage your viewers to sign it. We, we all need to not just clap our hands every, every Thursday for the NHS workers and, and, and the wonderful work that's going on uh, around our communities. We must also be banging the drum for an extension because things are going to get much worse for all of us uh, if Britain leaves the EU at the end of the year without a deal. Now, one of Keir Starmer's early victories has been to force the Prime Minister into a concession on charges in the National Health Service for NHS and care workers who are overseas nationals. Uh, does that give the new Europeans encouragement that there might be further concessions on the vexed issues of settled status and other matters which are jeopardising the prospects? As a campaigning organisation, do you see that as something of a, a breakthrough for, for hopefully more concessions to come? I think that is very encouraging, Alex. I, I have to say um, that although I would like Keir Starmer to be calling for an extension, and I'm a little bit disappointed that he's not doing that, I, I, he has been very, very good indeed over a long period of time before he was leader as well, very committed to the issue of uh, rights for EU citizens. And uh, that has continued now into into government. He he, he took up our, uh, our call for EU citizens to be given the vote in all elections, as has happened in, in Scotland, very credibly there for the 
the Scottish Government to have given EU citizens to the vote for the Scottish Parliament. And I'd like to see all EU citizens have the vote in the UK, and, I, and Keir Starmer is in favour of that. Finally, Roger Casale, despite the best campaigning efforts of the New Europeans and many other pro-Europe organisations, the reality is that the Britain has brexited. Do you see any glimmers of hope for the future in your campaigning efforts as the new Europeans? Well, what I often say to uh, colleagues in continental Europe and inside the European Union is if you want to find the strongest pro-European movement in Europe, you need to look no further than the United Kingdom and especially Scotland. And so I think that it's a case of not knowing what you have until it's gone sometimes. And we have to keep that going because I do believe that one day Britain will rejoin the European Union. And when it does, Alex, I think people need to understand, as I think many do in Scotland, if I may say so, that Europe is not just a community of interests, also a community of values. I think we can learn a lot from uh, from Scotland and the way in which Scotland understands that they, we have multiple identities. We can be Scottish, British, European, all at the same time. And we don't have to cut off our nose to spite our face by leaving the European Union just because we think we have to be British rather than European. We can be both. And I think when that particular penny drops, hopefully the tide will turn. Roger Casale from Italy, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Alex. In a fervently pro-European party, Alec Neil MSP is something of a rebel, a strong Scottish nationalist with big doubts about the European Union. How does he assess the current state of play in the negotiations and does he think his colleagues will be able to redeem their election commitment to stop Brexit? Alec Neil joins me from here. Alec Neil, the Irish Trade Commissioner, Mr Hogan, uh, suggested last week that there was no real serious intent behind the UK negotiations. Uh, do you think there's a, a point there? He claims that they're trying to shelter the economic impact of uh, a no deal behind the huge economic impact of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, is there any truth in that, you think? Well, I think Inevitably, the EU is engaged in a game they're always engaged in, and so is the UK government. At the end of the day, most of this is bluster because both sides are realistic and know that a deal is in the interests of everybody. Now, Alec Neil, you're a, a bit of a rebel on the European issue in terms of the SNP, but your colleagues campaigned and won on a a platform at the general election last December of stopping Brexit. Do you think they have any realistic chance of achieving that objective under the current circumstances? No, I, I think that Johnson, uh, particularly given all the people he surrounded himself with, this government is about uh, delivering Brexit and delivering it by the end of this calendar year. And I think it would take a great deal of persuasion and a great deal of different things to happen uh, if Johnson risked any more political capital uh, with his party. Uh, we've seen over the last few days how they've totally bungled the Dominic Cummings affair. That has already used up massive political capital by Boris Johnson, both internally within the Tory party as well as within the country. Uh, and I think the mood in Downing Street will be, come hell or high water, we're going to deliver Brexit by the end of the year, even if it means leaving in WTO terms. And unless the EU can come up with some kind of compromise in those circumstances, then I think that's what will happen. A fundamental deal will be signed, perhaps with an extension of the transition on the two or three areas that might be impossible to reach agreement on by the end of December. Now, in your uh, unusual position as a, a European Union sceptic, Scottish nationalist, a Scottish member of uh, the Parliament in, uh, in Edinburgh, if I were to say in order to break the Guardian knot, uh, in order to bring about a reconciliation between the, the two uh, negotiators at the present moment, we put Alec Neil uh, in charge of the, uh, of the negotiations by Zoom. Could you come up with a a solution which would uh, affect a smooth economic transition, uh, achieve a removal from the European Union but not put at risk jobs and livelihoods? 
Yes, I think I think there is a possibility to do that. I mean, I think the big issues are around the customs union, uh, rather than particularly the single market. Over the Johnson government's very uh, antipathetic towards the single market as well. If it, if we were negotiating on behalf of an independent Scotland, my view would be that an independent Scotland would be far better off joining EFTA. But of course, EFTA per se doesn't really want big United Kingdom joining four or three very, three or four very small countries. But there is maybe a compromise in there whereby you allow continued membership of the European Economic Area without necessarily including EFTA membership. So there are ways to achieve compromise. I'm absolutely sure of that. The issue is the political willingness on both sides in terms of the UK and the EU, whether they would want to do that. So in your judgment then, come the end of the year, come Hogmanay as we call it in Scotland, will it be deal or no deal? I think it will be a deal. I, I, I actually think it will be a deal because uh, coming back to COVID, uh, the European economy is on its knees. The Eurozone is facing a major problem with the ruling by the German Constitutional Court that the ECJ and the ECB, European Central Bank, have acted illegally by going over the top on quantitative easing, a major constitutional issue inside the EU. There's a potential collapse of Italy, the dropping out of the Eurozone. There's a failure so far to reach agreement on a package for the poorer countries within the EU in terms of helping them through the coronavirus, coronavirus crisis. So there's a lot in the internal plate of the EU. And similarly, the Johnson government is facing economic catastrophe if it doesn't take uh, substantial measures to rescue the UK economy from the results of COVID. So it's the interest of both sides, in my view, to reach an agreement. And that will have to be a compromise in a number of areas. But I believe agreement can and should be reached. Alec Neil, member of the Scottish Parliament, thank you for joining us on the Alex Salmon Show. Pleasure. If there had been no world pandemic, then Europe would still have been dominating the headlines in the United Kingdom. The talks are ongoing, but they are going nowhere fast. This leads to the very real risk that there'll be no deal at the end of the transition period, the dreaded no deal Brexit, just one year delayed. To a certain extent, lockdown has provided us with an insight into what a no deal Brexit would have meant. Fishermen with plenty of fish to catch, but no markets to sell it in. Farmers with no labour to bring in the harvest. The tourist industry with no international visitors. The care sector starved of other nationals as key aspects of their labour force. None of this makes for an appealing prospect. Perhaps the only redeeming feature of a Brexit under these circumstances is it can't be argued that it's caused a recession. The recession is already inevitable. However, it could turn a recession into a depression. An effort to Smeena and myself and all at the show. It's goodbye for now. Stay safe and we'll see you next week.